Hello, IPXers. We're again at Census Converge 2024, where we're meeting Louis, who is an award winner. And we're going to talk about why his company, MEI, is an award winner. He's going to tell you all about motion sensors and how incredibly clever they are. So first of all, let's talk about why you've won an award. Okay. Well, we uh, developed the world's first three-axis navigation grade, chip scale, multi-axis accelerometer. That's a mouthful. <laughs> yeah. right. So tell me yeah. what that actually means. Well, uh, accelerometers and gyros are inertial sensors uh, for all of you designing things where you want to measure, monitor the movement, or you want to do navigation, um, platform stabilization for cameras, for example. You're going to use an inertial sensor. And most time, it's going to be a MEMS inertial sensor because they're the most affordable. And unbreakable. And unbreakable, yeah. Especially ours. Right. So if you look at the motion sensor market, you can have a consumer, the consumer market where, you know, without saying, without being derogatory to anybody, but it's sort of uh, at the lower end of technology, lower end mm -hmm. of cost. And then you can go right down into, you know, sort of in very hardcore, maybe defense type uh, motion sensors, incredibly expensive, incredibly um, accurate. Yeah. Uh, but out, out of reach of the mainstream. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what I understand from your business is you sort of sit in the middle. Yeah. Would that be right? Yeah, we actually, we've developed um, an inertial sensor that'll give you the performance of a fifteen dollars to $20,000 sensor, yep. but at the cost of uh, something that's industrial or even consumer grade. Right. We're gonna be licensing the technology to startups that we'd like to work with, enabling their uh, applications and also large companies and projects that they have, like R&D projects, new product uh, applications, that ideas that they have. Now, for the first time, it'll be affordable enough to be able to do them. Right. So what's the technology that you bring in, in terms of, you know, understanding how, how, how these products work? You know, we sort of understand how, for instance, if you talk about uh, maybe if the GPS is not available right. or environments like that, mm -hmm. what, what's the what's the actual technology that sits behind how you do that? Obviously, not giving away secrets, but huh. what what's actually going on? Because this is a you know this is a very complicated. Now this is one might say a bit bit black magic -y, isn't it? A bit, it's a bit. It's well, a bit you know, uh, it's a, it, we're in some strange areas here in a way. Yeah, but there's one easy way to put it. We, have a, we have a big ass mass. Right. <laughs> so what does we got that a mean? Big, we got a big proof mass. Right. And we managed to put that proof mass in a hermetically sealed cavity, get the signals out of the proof mass, and that's a key part of our intellectual property, our uh, IP. And so we were the first to do that, first to do that at a commercial foundry where you can make many, many devices, large volume commercial foundry. And so we could stand up our production process at these foundries, work with them to make our devices in the millions or tens of millions of units for industries like automotive, autonomous yeah. vehicles, healthcare, med tech, sports performance, space, commercial space, especially low earth orbit, which is a big focus of ours. Um, so we're kind of robust enough to last in very challenging environments like space. Yep. Um, but we're small enough and cheap enough to go into things like an AR headset to do head tracking, as well as platform stabilization for a camera. Right. right? So if you're familiar with uh, assured position navigation timing, so you can do dead reckoning or you do navigation without the GPS. When you're in that situation, when it gets blocked or jammed, uh, it goes to the IMU, what we do. And the higher the grade the IMU, the longer you could do GPS, uh, um, you could do position navigation without the GPS. Right, right. So suddenly, um, there's a, it opens the door for a lot of different applications, not just replacing expensive parts in existing legacy systems, but also uh, creating new markets or new ideas for applications. So we like to work with subject matter experts, people that are designing things for different products and come up with new ideas because we may also change the actual design of the device as well. Right. So um, just trying to gather my thoughts while, 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 while you're talking, because this is quite, this is a complicated, this is a complicated area. Yeah. So if, 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 what would be the, you've, you've mentioned things like uh, drones potentially mm -hmm. and medical. Yeah. So if, 
when, when I asked you before we started chatting, I asked you, what, how would you solve the problem if you didn't exist? And right. you said, you wouldn't be able to. Yeah, well, so if, you, uh, if you're familiar with Fitbit wearables, yes. they all wear consumer grade devices. They yes. use consumer grade MEMS, so I have one of these. But the data that it gives you is really kind of a glorified step counter. If you're trying to do AI or machine learning or what they call tiny ML, which is at the edge, you're trying to compute at the edge, yep. you need higher accuracy data for better software. Right. So we always say that you can't software your way to a better sensor. We're starting off with a better sensor, and then you're gonna get better software from the better sensor. So what you just described there was if you are in, if you're, if, if you're let's say, doing edge computing, or you're doing something uh, you know, involving AI and you're taking in a lot of data, yep. we all know about that, yep. but what you've just described there was it's almost, you know, you're only as good as the sensor gives you yeah. in order to make that solution work. That's right. So that's why your your positioning sensors are so key mm -hmm. in those types of applications. Right. Because like, it's the old fashioned cliche, this is only as good as what you put in. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, it's garbage in, garbage out when yeah. you do uh, AI, right? Yeah. So you, get, you have to get the highest accuracy data that you can to build your data sets. That's like key. We're offering the highest value inertial data, the highest accuracy, which inertial data is very expensive. You go from a consumer grade device to industrial grade, um, it's the difference between one or $2,000 per axis. Right. When you get to tactical or navigation grade, you're talking anywhere from five to 10,000 or more per axis. So if you want a three axis accelerometer, you're spending a lot. Yeah. So it depends on how badly you need the accuracy. Right, right. Now, you may need the accuracy, but you can't afford the sensor. Now you can. Yeah. If you're working with us and we're, you know, collaborating with you, uh, we're licensing the technology to you. And we're actually looking for people that have really good, cool applications ideas. Yeah. Because right now we should know maybe 30% of uh, how uh, of the total markets they can address right now. Yeah. Because people are going to look at it and say, wait, I actually, I, I have an idea. Now I could do that. Now I could that, get that kind of data for my software, for my center fusion. Yeah. And so I want to use it for this particular niche area. Right, right. So we're really, really interested in that and kind of enabling the applications development. So that's very interesting because if you, if you, you know, we, we, we spend our whole, if you go and look at our library of videos uh, and you look at what we've been talking about in the last 12 months, we've been talking about machine learning, we've been talking about AI, we've been talking about sensors, we've been talking about low power, we've been talking about all those environments that you've just been talking about, mm -hmm. um, but we've never been talking about a MEM sensor. We never right, talk so, about a position sensor, but yeah. that's very interesting because you all of a sudden made a point that, in actual fact, if you want that kind of data, uh -huh. you need a very different kind of sensor. So, yeah. so in other words, your time has come because yeah. of the need for that higher use of high quality data that you can yeah. get before at the cost that you're offering it at. That's right, that's right. So, so I mean, IoT devices or edge devices, they all have multiple MEMS sensors. Yeah. Not just inertial, but pressure sensor, magnetometer, time of flight sensor. Yeah, yeah. A bat sensor, right? And, but they're MEMS. So MEMS technology enables these low cost sensors. Originally, gyros and accelerometers came from defense. They came from missile yes. guidance systems. Yeah. And then we just kept shrinking them and shrinking them, and they eventually ended up in a smartphone from 2010. So that's when they were first adopted in right. mass. Right. So right. we're still at the beginning. And if you're young and you're doing design, uh, get involved in robotics, get involved in space applications. This is our audience. For sure. This yeah. is our audience. Um, edge devices, doing things at the edge. Um, we work with AI chip companies, for example, to do more calculations at the edge because you're not going to be able to send your data to the cloud sometimes. Yeah. You're going to be stuck and you got to do things at the edge. You're going to yeah. make decisions there. So uh, we're enabling that with much better data so you have much better software. Yeah, okay. Well, we have a saying at IP Exchange, which is this must be alien technology. There's sometimes when I meet people and I think, it, you know, it, it's alien technology. And I think that you're right on the cusp of that. It takes a long time. Yeah. It takes a long time to do R&D in this particular area. Yeah. Like 10 to 15 years. Yeah. You know, we worked on the process technology for almost a decade. And then you're still taking risks because you don't know if it's going to work. You don't know if you've patented it. So we kind of went through all of that. And um, 
we went after a, in a market that only the big companies try to go after. They received a lot of government money for it, but they, they, took, they, they took chances on technology that couldn't be transferred from a lab to a foundry, yeah. to a large volume foundry. We started our process technology development at the foundry. The other way around. Yeah, the other way around. So that was a big difference. Right, right. Yeah, manufacturability was really important from the beginning. Yeah. And uh, my my co-founder and our CTO developed the digital light processing chip, which is a really, really big deal in our space. And that ended up in every overhead projector, most of the movie uh, theater projectors, that technology. So yeah. to be able to work with someone like that is you know, amazing. Yeah. As far as long as we've been together. Uh, okay, so from for, from our, our point of view, this is a, an introductory where it senses uh, 2020 sensors converge, as they call it, at 2024. This is an award winner. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, this is definitely right on the on the cusp of alien technology and understanding how you take, quite frankly, defense technology into the mainstream, coming from the manufacturing starting point as opposed to the other end of how most people start. Um, company called NEI. Uh, thank you very much for that in introduction about that. Great, thank and you. we will talk more, I think. Definitely thank appreciate you. it. Thanks. Are you, where are my engineers at?